In fall of 2022, California was experiencing its worst drought in history. With much of the state receiving a mere 30% of its expected rainfall, lakes and reservoirs were getting dangerously low, so much so that the town of Coalinga was expected to run out of water by winter. For a state that's considered America's food-producing powerhouse, generating over 11% of the United States' agricultural value, this lack of water poses a much greater threat than just the added cost of having to buy it bottled from a store. While the forecast in October called for the exceptional drought to continue into winter, the exact the opposite happened. Unusually powerful storms repeatedly slammed into California's Pacific coast, resulting in one of the wettest winters in state history and one of the most treacherous to navigate. Extensive flooding, landslides, water spouts, and tornadoes affected the Bay Area through Southern California. Over a hundred inches of snow fell in the Sierra Nevadas. With many reservoirs across the state already filled to the brim, state officials are bracing for the possibility of another wet, stormy winter. Today, we're looking at why the drought forecast was so wrong, what the driving forces that determine drought and rain in California are, and why this vicious cycle of feast or famine has plagued California for so long and will likely get worse into the future. California is one of, if not the most diverse states in the country. Spanning over 800 miles across its major axis, the state is home to Death Valley the desert below sea level that sports the highest daytime summer temperatures in North America, Mount Whitney, the highest mountain peak in the lower 48, and lush temperate rainforests along the northwestern coast. The rugged, ever-changing terrain creates dozens of microclimates, or local sets of atmospheric conditions that differ from those in the surrounding areas. If you've ever visited Los Angeles in September and then driven a few hours north to San Francisco, you can get a pretty good glimpse at what these microclimates are like. Despite the small-scale diversity, the weather across the state is governed by two major entities, the mountains to the east and the Pacific Ocean to the west. To the east, the Sierra Nevadas and Southern Cascade Range create a barrier between California and what is known as the Great Basin, the area encompassing nearly all of Nevada, where water doesn't flow out of. All the rain in this area collects into lakes, which either slowly evaporate or trickle underground. In the winter, Canadian high pressure containing cool, dry air pushes south from the high plains, and this air does reach the Great Basin. Even though it's essentially a desert, winter highs are typically in the low 40s, with nighttime temperatures well below freezing. But the Cascade and Sierra Nevada mountains essentially block this cold air from spilling out of the Great Basin into California, meaning that winter highs in Sacramento tend to float around a much warmer 56 degrees. To the west of California sits the Pacific Ocean, one of the most violent, mysterious, and influential bodies of water on Earth. The temperature of the surface of the water greatly influences the air masses that exist above them that in turn influence the large-scale weather systems to the east. In the summer, due to the higher angle of the sun, the ocean temperatures between California and Hawaii are quite warm, over 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This warm water heats the air above it and creates a bubble of high pressure known as the North Pacific High. This area of high pressure helps to push the jet stream further to the north, keeping California, Oregon, and Washington mostly sunny and dry for the summer months. But in the winter, when these waters cool down, the North Pacific High starts to dissolve, and the jet stream dives back southward over the region. The Aleutian Low, a counterclockwise circulation of low pressure, strengthens near Alaska. Low pressure storm systems form over the temperature boundaries in the northern Pacific in the winter, and due to their northerly latitude, the Coriolis force caused by the spinning of the Earth deflects the storm, creating tightly spiraling extratropical cyclones with winds over over 100 miles an hour. These storms then slam into Alaska, British Columbia, and less often Washington and Oregon. But if you take a look at these storms, you can see the tight spiral of the occluded front, but you also see this tail stretching down to the south. This is the cold front, and although it weakens the further away you get from the center of the system, it still pushes the humid tropical air to the east. In fact, this tropical air ahead of the cold front becomes concentrated in a narrow band high in the atmosphere, which flies northeastward, condensing into dense bands of showers and thunderstorms. This is called an atmospheric river, and you probably remember hearing it a lot within the past year. These atmospheric rivers then slam into the west coast, dumping inches of rain on the state of California. The mountains only increase the amount of precipitation that falls from these atmospheric rivers because when the air rises, more moisture is able to condense and fall as snow. 
in a typical year, about half of all of California's rainfall comes from these atmospheric rivers. The good news is that these atmospheric rivers are pretty easy to see several days before they hit, meaning that people in the path can prepare for a flooding event. What's not so clear is how many atmospheric rivers will hit each winter and how bad each of them will be. California's relationship with atmospheric rivers is very feast or famine, and this can lead to an extremely dichotomous climate from year to year. Take a look at this total rainfall by year chart for the state. While there is a running average, most years are significantly above or significantly below. In fact, you can see that from 2012 to 2016, California was in an extreme drought with rainfall well below average, only to have the wettest year on record in 2017, with most of the state seeing 180% of its average rainfall. But this isn't even the whole picture. Since the year 2000, California has had three separate smaller stretches of drought years. 2000 to 2003, 07 to 09, and 2012 to 2016. You can even see a fourth period starting to emerge in the past few years. Each of these periods was followed by a very wet winter filled with atmospheric rivers crashing onto the coast. But even including these soaker years, 2001 to 2022 was the driest 22-year span for the American West since 800 AD, and the periods of drought in between the soaker years seem to be getting more extreme. The critical point in this most recent drought was around fall of 2022. By the first week of September, 99.48% of the state was experiencing moderate to exceptional drought. An incredibly strong region of high pressure was building into the area from Mexico and created a blocking pattern that lasted about 10 days. This heat dome caused record high temperatures in Sacramento and Merced, reaching an astounding 116 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 46 degrees Celsius. Demand on Pacific Gas and Electric's power grid was at an all-time high, and rolling blackouts were highly recommended to prevent a full-on grid failure. The excessive heat was pushing freshwater fish in Utah's reservoirs to their biological limit. Dozens of people died as a result of the heat dome across the western U.S. By November, statewide reservoir storage was at 69% of its yearly average. All California residents were asked to reduce their water usage by at least 15%. Lake Mead and Lake Powell along the Colorado River were the lowest in recorded human history, in fact, Lake Mead was 145 feet in elevation away from becoming a dead pool, where it would no longer be able to generate hydroelectric power. Due to the low level of the lake, many human remains were found, including bones in a wooden barrel likely from the 1980s. While crops are certainly affected directly by heat, the farm workers themselves are at the highest risk for heat-related harm. Spending long hours in the fields of the Sacramento Valley in record heat will kill you. As the end of autumn drew near, forecasters and NOAA's Climate Prediction Center anxiously collected data and made predictions on whether or not the drought would continue into winter. One thing was clear, La Nina was to continue for a third consecutive year. In a La Nina event, cold waters in the Pacific work in tandem with the atmospheric circulations like the Walker and Hadley cells, which are areas of rising and sinking air in the tropics. Where the tropical air rises, you get clouds and thunderstorms, and where it sinks, you get clear conditions. The result of La Nina is a jet stream that is stronger to the west of Hawaii and weaker closer to the contiguous United States. You can really see the difference between the two in this graphic. This weaker jet allows the North Pacific high to be much larger and stronger off the west coast of the U.S., resulting in a much drier winter for the Golden State. But La Nina isn't the only oscillating weather pattern at work. There are much smaller other weather patterns that push and pull air masses around the globe and have a much shorter lifespan. The Madden-Julian Oscillation is an eastward-moving disturbance of clouds, rainfall, winds, and pressure that traverses the planet in the tropics and returns to its initial starting point in about 30 to 60 days on average. This disturbance is essentially a large pocket of rising air, convection, rain, and storms, and it's very visible when you're looking for it. When the convective phase of the Madden-Julian Oscillation made its way into the Central Pacific in mid-December, it became clear that several atmospheric rivers would be heading for California by the end of the month. In a recent study done by Jai Bao Wang, Michael DeFlorio, Ben Guan, and Christopher Castellano, it was found that MJO activity over the Western Pacific in early winter is associated with atmospheric rivers transporting that moisture to the west coast of the United States. The upper level ridge that usually exists over the west coast in La Nina failed to materialize in December of 2022, resulting in an east-west flow of the jet stream, or a zonal flow. 
As troughs or kinks within the jet stream flowed from west to east in short succession, the associated surface storms essentially yanked moisture from the Madden Julian Oscillation and flung it towards the California coast. This synchronization of several different naturally occurring phenomena meant that all bets were off for another dry winter. And while the rain and snow was welcomed with open arms at first, the optimism was very short-lived. Between December 28th and January 19th, Nine separate atmospheric rivers crashed into California, dropping trillions of gallons of water across the state. On the 31st, all six lanes of Highway 101 in downtown San Francisco were flooded as five and a half inches of rain fell on a single day, the second wettest day on record. Avalanche warnings were issued around Lake Tahoe. On January 4th, a bomb cyclone, which is a low pressure system that drops at least 24 millibars in a 24 hour period, rode up the coast of the Pacific Northwest, pumping another major atmospheric river onto the central coast. Winds gusted to 70 miles an hour as the cold front crashed ashore, but reached over 100 miles an hour in Tahoma. Several piers in Capitola and Seacliff were destroyed by the wind and waves. From here, things only got worse. Between January 7th and 11th, three more atmospheric rivers made landfall on California. Sacramento saw another two and a half inches of rain. Much of the towns of Merced and Planeta were underwater. According to state officials, January 10th likely saw the most air rescues in a single day in state history. Many sinkholes formed along winding mountain roads across the state. The dry, crumbling dirt compacted from the multi-year drought turned into a thick mud with torrential rain, and there was serious concern for life-threatening mudslides. Over the next week, two additional atmospheric rivers hit central and northern California. Flood watches and warnings were in effect for 26 million people, and evacuation orders were issued. Bishop California reached its average annual rainfall in less than two weeks. At Lake Tahoe, over 100 inches of snow fell before January 20th. Snowpack in the Sierra Nevadas was already reaching nearly 150% of its seasonal average. But after the nine atmospheric rivers claimed 21 lives in three weeks, the jet stream started to lift back to the north. Over the next couple weeks, an interesting secondary pattern developed. A ridge of high pressure would build over the west coast, and then quite suddenly, a trough of low pressure would swing down over the southwest and become a cutoff low, meandering across the southern United States. These cutoff lows are deep and slow moving because they are cut off from the westerly flow of the jet stream. They don't get propelled at lightning speed across the country. When a cutoff low is particularly deep and moves into a region with contrasting temperatures, they can produce powerful storms on the eastern unstable side. Coupled with the moisture from an atmospheric river, the effects can be record-breaking. Several of these cutoff lows floated through the southwestern US in February, but none was more powerful than the storm on February 22nd. As a trough of low pressure and brutally cold air dug down over the Pacific Northwest and raced to the east, a smaller cutoff low continued to dig south towards warmer Pacific Ocean waters. Beneath the column of cold air, an extratropical cyclone pulled in the equivalent of trillions of gallons of moisture from the tropics. Winter storm warnings were issued for areas above 1,500 feet in elevation, but snow was possible nearly everywhere. In the central coast, a trace of snow covered the beach in Santa Cruz, while Highway 19, connecting Santa Cruz to Los Gatos, was completely shut down. 65 mile an hour winds raced up the mountains, toppling hundreds of trees, knocking down dozens of power lines. Four and a half inches of additional rain fell in Los Angeles, as well as a rare hail and grapple storm. It looked like a November day in Cleveland. On March 10th, another cutoff low slammed into NorCal, but this time the air mass was much warmer, meaning that areas which previously saw snow now saw rain. This was a bad situation, as that rain would now rapidly melt some of the snowpack, increasing the major flooding potential. In Monterey County, the overflowing Pajaro River trapped dozens of residents in their cars. 200 people needed to be rescued from the town. The Kern River looked more like a raging tsunami, now 11 feet above flood stage. A landslide washed out Highway 84 in Woodside, causing the asphalt to buckle and crack. Back in Lake Tahoe, roofs were beginning to collapse under the weight of the excessive snowfall. On March 21st, the 12th atmospheric river and associated low had moved ashore in central California, but this time a new natural disaster was added to the bingo card. Thunderstorms on the southeastern side of the low were in a pocket of modest instability and wind shear directly under a jet streak. Conditions were marginally unstable, and sometimes that's all it takes for a weak short-lived tornado. 
This EF1 tornado just happened to drop right over the Los Angeles metro. It tore roofs off of homes and warehouses in the densely populated neighborhood. Low-end tornadoes are still extremely dangerous when they travel through cities. If you get hit with a large piece of flying debris like this, it could very well be fatal. In April and beyond, the climate has somewhat settled in California as the La Nina pattern has dissolved. The three-year drought has all but been quenched as only 6% of the state is classified as abnormally dry as of mid-October 2023. The question now is what should California expect for this winter? Well, since last year, we've transitioned out of La Nina and into an El Nino pattern, which means historically the West Coast should expect an average to above average rainy season. But there's been so much chaotic variability in the climate in the past few decades that it's incredibly difficult to accurately predict. One thing is true though, it's unlikely that California will see an exact repeat of last year's atmospheric river gauntlet. I hope you guys learned a thing or two about the climate of California and why it's such a feast or famine type of state when it comes to rain. If you're one of the people who had to deal with California's winter last year, definitely leave a comment, share your story below. If you have any recommendations on what you want to see next, leave a comment. I read all of those as well. Like, subscribe, share, you know what to do. See you soon.